fading flower. So a lot of times people think, you know, today you're here and tomorrow you fall away. Not necessarily. Not in most cases. Most cases, you're already setting up for that. Especially for those that's been around for a few years. Say no, he's not going to get you on some obvious thing like, let's go worship another God. But he'll let correction and things like that get to you, eat at your spirit, and slowly you begin to fade away from your chief love. Now watch this. Let me finish this again. Woe to the crown. I'm sorry, you read it, Cap. Yes, sir. Woe to the crown of the pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. That are overcome with wine. In this case, Ephraim was talking about doctrines. They went into idolatry. Not too long after this, they were carried away by um, Salmaneser, the king of the Assyrians. But now watch this. In the same chapter, jump to verse, um, I lost my place, down, but verse uh, 7. Verse 7. But they also have erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. That wine is doctrines. And guess the end result of them in this, they do what? The last part, they err what? They err in vision. They err in vision. You know what vision is? Vision is when you can foresee something and you can plan ahead. All of us here, need to have the mind of a visionary. We have to see the long-term goal of what we're trying to achieve. A lot of times we get caught up in, in the moment and we lose focus on, can I endure to the end? I'm going to show you something. I'm going to tell you something. You could be right about something, but by the way you handle it, will make you just as wrong. Right. Even if you was arid, even somebody arid and did something to you, by the way you handle it, can make you just as wrong. So we all prescribe that we all know Christ is our king. We're the Israelites. We're the only nation with the own true God. This home that you all here building and we're building throughout the world in IUIC is to bring about Christ's kingdom. And because of correction, you would walk away from it. Because pride has convinced you you're right and everybody else is wrong. We have to put down that spirit. Now it says, they err in vision. They, st they stumble in judgment. They stumble in judgment. You know how you stumble in judgment sometimes? You get your Bible and your concordance, and you put together all these precepts to justify yourself. Mm -hmm. And you got all the wrong precepts. But in your mind, you think you piece it together properly. But remember the, the first thing we read. The woe to the crown of pride. Because all those precepts you put together, your mind was in a prideful state. So ain't nothing good going to come out those precepts. Even though you put them together and they lay down flat in your mind. But the Bible says what? Read on. Verse 8. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. It says, for all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there's no place clean. You know what that table is talking about? The scripture is talking about your mind. Your mind is full of filth. There's no place in your mind clean. So what good precept can you really bring out? Who knows better than you that you're moving in the spirit of hatred or pride? It's a cunning demon. Hold this, we're going to come right back here. Go to Jeremiah 17. It's a cunning demon. Read that for me. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 9. This is what it says. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The heart is desperately wicked. You know what I mean? Des you know something is desperate? What it means? At all cost. It's going to try to what? Convince you. At all cost, the mind is desperate to find a way and answer to justify itself. It's desperately wicked. Read on. Who can know it? You can know it. You know your mind. I'm going to ask a question. I don't want you to raise your hand. I just want you to think. How many 
of us in here have, don't raise your hand now, have a problem with correction. Think about it in your head. How many of us have a problem being told that you're wrong? If you can answer to yourself honestly and say you do, just know, don't ever listen to your mind. Your mind, like my mind, is desperately wicked. I don't trust my mind. I tell you, I keep on saying in my classes, if it ain't written here, I don't trust it. Because I know I can convince myself of whatever I want to, if I want to. God already told me, I made you, and I'm telling you, your mind is desperately wicked. No, God, I'm right. Dude, I made you. I'm telling you, your mind ain't right. Desperately wicked. At all, point, at all costs, you point fingers, you'll try to find a way around it. Now, look what it says. Read on. Verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways. God said, listen, I try the heart. I search your reins. I know how you think. And I'm going to give you according to your doing. So back in Isaiah, when we read in 28 and, 9, 28 and 8, it said what? Isaiah chapter 28, verse 8. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no place clean. That's your mind. There's no place clean. No place clean because of pride. Read on. Verse 9. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. So who's God going to make to understand doctrine, to understand knowledge? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. These commandments. That's who's going to understand. They're going to know that their mind is desperately wicked. They're going to understand what pride is. Watch, read on. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. They're going to put this Bible together, precept upon precept. Here's the point I wanted. Read on. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. And it's this language that we're here speaking this bastard tongue, English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, this word was going to come to us. To tell us what in this chapter? Be careful with pride. Read on. To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Yet they would not hear. I'm asking a question. It says, this is the rest wherewith you cause the weary to rest. This is the refreshing, yea, they would not hear. What does it mean, yea, they would not hear? One word. Nobody knows. Pride. It's pride. Yea, they would not listen. Why? Their mind is filthy. There's nothing clean there. He's saying this is the rest where you can unburden yourself with all the pride and you go through right here in these words. Let it go. Move on. Take the correction. Don't let it destroy you. But yet, because of pride, they would not listen. How, I'm asking you, ca captains and deacons, how many people you've seen come and go for no other reason other than pride? They just can't take it, men and women. Are you like, are you going to let all this go because somebody hurts your feelings? They will not hear it. Read on. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept. But this person with pride, the word of the Lord was unto them what? Precept upon precept. Oh, they're breaking it down. They got all the precepts. Read Pre on. Precept upon precept, line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. You know what they're doing? They're studying these scriptures to justify themselves. That's the only reason they're studying it. I got to find this precept, to, this precept, and this precept to prove what I'm saying. You know, sometimes if the Spirit of God is on you, or when the Spirit of God is on you, you don't have to justify yourself. Your fruits will justify you. Time will justify you. You don't need to try to prove nothing. Just stay in these scriptures. Hey, you just, okay, I understand. I get it right. I'm sorry. I'm cool. But no, you there all night, you and your concordance trying to look up words. Let me find precepts to go. What's the synonym of this word? Man, your mind is filthy, man. You can't get it. Is there more? Yes, sir. Read on. 
that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. You fall out of this truth. Read on. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. It says, hear, now, wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men, that rule the people. Who is he talking about? These leaders that have a spirit of pride. You scornful men. Now, why did I stop there concerning leaders? Watch this. Let's go to Sirach, chapter 10. Pride, a cunning demon. And many people stumble at the word because of it. 10 and 1. Sirach, chapter 10 and verse 1. A wise judge will instruct his people. And the government of a prudent man is well ordered. Not a scornful, but a wise judge. Not a scornful judge. A wise judge will instruct his people. And the government of the prudent is well ordered. He knows how to order things aright, beginning with himself. Read on. As the judge is of the people is himself. So are his officers. And what manner of man the ruler of the city is, such are they that dwell therein. Right. So he understands as the judges, so will the officer be. So if you've got a judge or leader that's full of pride, he's going to raise up men just like that. They're going to be the same exact way. And everybody's going to walk around with a spirit. How do you build a nation when everybody's moving in a prideful spirit? Us as leaders, we're examples to you on not to let pride overshadow right from wrong. We ourselves make mistakes. We're not perfect. And we have to be able to verbalize it and act on it to give example. Now watch what it says. Read on. Verse 3. An unwise king destroyeth his people, but through the prudence of them which are in authority, the city shall be inhabited. But an unwise king will destroy his people. That's that scornful leader. But through prudence... Of them which are in authority, the city shall be inhabited. Meaning what? That city will grow. That city is right here. It's being built right now. We're growing. We're growing. Why? Because the men set up over you is not moving in the spirit of pride. And if they are, God will move them out the way. He will be destroyed. Watch this. Let's jump on down in the same chapter. I want to jump down to verse. Um, shall I read on? I right, jump to verse 7. Let's jump through this real quick. Verse 7. Verse 7. Pride is hateful before God and man, and by both doth one commit iniquity. It says pride is hateful before God and man. God hates a prideful man. And you know what? Men will hate a prideful man. Because he can never be told anything. And it says what? The last part of that says what? And by both doth one commit iniquity. And by both one doth commit iniquity. Pride? It says by both. By pride and hateful. You have a hateful spirit. When you have a prideful spirit. And by both doth one commit iniquity. Read on. Because of unrighteous dealings, injury, injuries, and riches got by deceit, the kingdom is translated from one people to another. Read. Why is earth and ashes proud? That's talking about man. Read on. There is not a more wicked thing than a covetous man. For such an one setteth his own soul to sell... Because while he liveth, he casteth away his bowels. It says, why is earth and ashes proud? Go to Sirach 17. Seventeen thirty-two, Proving earth and ashes is man. Sirach chapter 17, verse 32. He vieweth the power of the height of heaven, and all men are but earth and ashes. So we know man is referring to earth and ashes. So back in 10.9. Um, Sirach chapter 10 and verse 9. 
If thou be invited. No, no uh, Sirach 10 and 9. I'm sorry. My mistake. And I want you to read right to the, uh, to the question mark. Yes, sir. You said 10 and 1 or 10 and 9? 10 and 9, please. 10 and 9. Why is earth and ashes proud? Why is man proud? Why is he proud? Read on. There is not a more wicked thing than a covetous man. It says there's nothing more wicked than a covetous man. Why, does it, why is it referring to covetous now? What is a covetous man? What's one of the attributes of somebody who's covetous? Black shirt, somebody. Right there. Shalom, Bishop, Brother Kaznai. Oh, lustful. Okay, lustful, but okay, right. In in regards to pride, it says covetous. It says nothing. I'm sorry. Why is earth and ashes proud? It's a question. There's nothing more wicked than a covetous man. Give me the attribute of covetous. Shalom, Bishop. Um, envy. Okay. Let me answer it. Somebody who have a covetous spirit, he's about himself. When it says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, it's telling you, you don't give a damn about your neighbor. It's all about you. That's a prideful spirit where you don't care what everybody's saying. It's me. I'm right. It's me. It's about me. It don't work here. It should not work here. That self-absorbed, self-righteous, covetous, always thinking about how it benefits. You bring out a scripture, I'm going to find a scripture to explain why I'm right, why it's me, me, than just laying down and taking it. Deacon, you want to say something? Okay. When you have that covetous spirit, you are self-absorbed. Pride is you're better than everybody else. You can't tell me. I deserve. Watch this. Read on. Verse 10. The physician. No, no, the same verse 9. Verse 9. Why is earth and ashes proud? There is not a more wicked thing than a covetous man. For such an one setteth his own soul to sell. You know when you setteth your own soul to sell? You're going to kill yourself. You, you want to lose, sell your soul because you just are so self-absorbed. I can't be wrong, so I'm so right that I'm going to leave this body. I'm going to prove to you guys. And, and guess what? You out there eating brisket on Passover. You're going, pss, pss, pss. sit, stupid. <laughs> you you want to lose everything. Get that in Hebrews 12 real quick. You know what I'm talking about? Um, for one morsel of, you know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. It's the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. Give me the correction. I'm not looking with you. Give me the part of correction and jump yes, down sir. to, then give me the morsel part. Verse uh, 16. Lest there be any fornicator or for profane. No, no, give me the point. I'm not looking. Just give me the, where he correct. Chastity is not. And then jump down to... Um, yes, sir. Verse 6. For You said chasteneth. Well, it's not comely, but it's yieldeth. Let me go there. You know what I'm talking, talking about. about oh, Thank oh you. verse 11. Thank you. It says, Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, after it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Right, you get correction, but it's going to yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It don't seem good, but it's good for you. But if you process this as something bad, now read the next part. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Because you're wounded. It says don't be wounded to the point now you sobbing or you moping and you in the back of the room and woe is me. Read on. And make straight paths for your feet. Read on. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. You fought this truth. Read on. But let it rather be healed. Read on. 
Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. It's saying after correction, you better learn to follow peace with all men because your feelings are hurt. You better learn because without that, you will not see the Lord. What would stop you from following peace? Pride. Pride would stop you from doing it. You know what gets me in this truth? We're, we're, we are reformed, you know, a, a reforming our thoughts. We would, we would deal with all manner of Negroes in the streets. And they would do all type of foul and murder and robbery in here. Somebody tell you do something wrong. And it, it irks me when I see big, strong, grown men emotional. Yo, who is he to tell me that? Well, that's my job. I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to tell you. You hurt my feelings. You know that sounds as men? He hurt my feelings. Are you joking? Dudes did in prison doing push-ups for 20 years to come out. He hurt my feelings. You shouldn't have said that. Oh, gosh. We ain't, we, ain't come, we, ain't, we ain't come out this captivity with men like that. No. Go to daughter Sarah meetings. Please. You gotta be joking. Can't believe he said that. <laughs> Read on. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any man fail of the grace or the mercies of God. Read on. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. Let any root of bitterness spring up, it troubles you. Read on. And thereby many be defiled. Read on. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. And this is what it says. Lest you be like Esau. Read on. Who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For one morsel of meat he sold away his birthright. Read on. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. You understand why they use that analogy with Esau? For one morsel of meat, he threw away his birthright. Because a little bit correction, you leave. Your feelings hurt. You run away. For a little bit, somebody tell you, you know you're wicked. You know you're an idiot what you just did, right? Who are you to say that? I'm not coming back. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Next. <laughs> you throw away everything. You risk everything because of your pride. Pride is cunning, man. And in your mind, you think you're right. But that's only you. You're counseling with your own self. Let's say this. Let's say you are right. Let's just say you're right. Wouldn't that be thankworthy with God if you endeavor? Say it right. You suffer. Wrongfully. Damn, I butchered that. Boy, endeavor. Where's that word? You suffer wrongfully, but you know that you're part of a mission, that I just have to eat that and move on because I see the bigger picture because I got a long-term vision, and I know what this body is moving towards, and these are hiccups we have. With God, that's thankworthy. First Peter 2 says that. But your feelings are hurt. Let's go back. We finished that, right? Yes, sir. Let's go back to, um, he said it this, uh, verse 10 and 9. This is Sirach chapter 10, verse 9. Why is the earth in ashes proud? There is not a more wicked thing than a covetous man. For such and one setteth his own soul to sell. You sell your soul to sell. You give up because of pride. You hate yourself. Read on. Because while he liveth, he casteth away his bowels. While you have chance and you alive, you throw away everything because of it. Jump on down to verse 12. Let me get through this real quick. Verse 12. The beginning of pride is when one departeth from God. Ah, here we go. And his heart is turned away from his maker. His mind has been turned away from his maker. Pride. This is what it says. The beginning of pride is when one departed from God. So here's it for you, sisters and brothers. Here's a identifying sign pride comes in. The scripture comes out and you get offended. Just words come out and it, it offends you. Now you should know pride is kicking in. Christ said, you shouldn't be offended in the word. That's when you begin to, de- look what it says. You're beginning to depart from the maker. It's a process of time. You're slowly fading away like that flower we read 
in uh, Isaiah 28. You slowly fade. Your, your, your light is dimming. And where's all this happening? Right up here. We may not see it openly, but inside you're struggling. You're starting to depart from the maker. And this class may be for some people in here right now. This is your lifeline. Read on. For pride is the beginning of sin, and he that hath it shall pour out abomination. You're going to begin to pour out abomination because your mind is filthy. There's no clean place in it. It's dirty. And he that hath it shall pour out abomination. And therefore the Lord brought upon them strange calamities and overthrew them utterly. So then strange calamities start coming upon us. And overthrew us. Strange calamity. And then we're wondering, why is these things happening? You know why. There's something in you. Hold this. Uh, no, let this go. Strange calamities come upon us. Watch this. Go to Psalms 10. Watch this. Psalms 10. Psalms 10, verse. Bear with me. Verse 1. Psalm chapter 10, verse 1. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? Then you're asking, Lord, why are you, why are you standing far off? Lord, I'm calling on you, Lord. Why are you not dealing with me? What's happening? Read on. The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. It says the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. Read on. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous, whom the Lord abhorreth. Read on. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. It says the wicked, through the pride of his countenance. You know what that is? That's that man, his, his face, you can tell his countenance is testifying what he's going through. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. Hold this. Psalms 29. One. Then I want you to read verse 19. Psalms chapter 29, verse 1. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Wait, so what did I say? You, you Proverbs, says, Proverbs 29. I'm, I'm okay. Sorry. Proverbs 29. I'm sorry. Yes. But I want you to hold this. We're going to come right back to Psalms 10. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1. He that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed. We just read that. Then you wonder why it's happening. You ask your Lord why. He says because when you're often reproved, you become what? Stiff neck, rebellious. Now watch this. Here's one sign of that stiff neck and rebellion. Uh, go to verse 19 of that chapter. Verse 19. A servant will not be corrected by words. A servant will not be corrected by words. Read on. For though he understand, he will not answer. Though he understand his continence, he will not answer. He'll give you a look like this. He ain't testifying. He ain't acknowledging what's being said. You know when you got a contrite heart and somebody saying something like, yeah, yeah, man, I know. All right, cool. Or you get that look where it's that obstinate look like. Just going through it and you're just like, in your mind, you're like, nigga, please. Mm. Yes, officer. He will not. You know why he won't speak? Read that last part. For though he understand, he will not answer. He will not verbalize, confess, and let it go. He can't because his God, Satan, controls his tongue and said, nigga, you don't speak now. And people be warring on inside and they can't, they can't utter to say, I'm wrong. I'm sorry. My bad. It, they will go to death before they do that. They will leave and call everybody here evil just so they don't have to acknowledge that. You got a God 
And his name is the devil. And he's ruling you. He got his foot, he got his pants so far up your rectum, got you like a puppet. You hold your mouth. Don't speak, nigga. I didn't give you permission to speak. Let's go back. Yeah, go ahead. You know, there's a scripture that says, Before I go before destruction. I know you're gonna go over there. Uh give me give I'm, I'm gonna read one scripture. Give me first Corinthians. I'm gonna show you what why. First Corinthians six and seven. This is the book of First Corinthians chapter six and verse seven. This is what Paul said. Because we all know there was a lot of crazy stuff in the church of Corinth. Read what Paul said. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you. Because you a fault among you is two brothers. Something going on between two brothers. A fourth among us, right? Read. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you, because ye go to law one with another. So Paul said, you go to law. In other words, you go to the heathen. You go to the, you go to the Esau courthouse. Read. Why do ye not rather take wrong? That's a very, very, very hard thing for a Negro to do. Paul said, why you just, you, you know, me and you is arguing. I know them right, you, you right. But Paul said, listen, that's your brother. Just say you wrong, just to keep, the, to keep the brotherhood going. But you know what the pride for me will do? He will destroy everybody. He will destroy everything. Just for a little thing. I remember... I went to Austin. You got officers of 50 who cannot break down Matthew chapter 18. All the blood they have to do is apply it. He will not apply it. The brother, the, the pride jumped so high in the brother. The brother forgot the scripture. Christ said, all money of sin are forgiven. You know, all the men forget that scripture. They, they, they come and say, no. No, I condemn you. This I'm like, boy, you know that the blood can repent, right? I don't want to hear it. I don't, I'm like, what you mean you don't want to hear it? That's what the scripture said. That's what a prideful, a prideful man do. A prideful man will take a little thing, make it bigger than it is. But Paul say here, read what Paul say again. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because ye go to law with one another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? <laughs> Listen, a prideful man will never do this. That's a hard thing to do. As long as I got know you the right one, you you right. Okay, brother, you know what? Just to keep the brotherhood, I tell you what, I'm wrong. You right. We good? Oh okay, yeah, we good. Let's keep it moving. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. That's called brotherhood. That's called my brother keeper. That's wisdom. Go ahead, Bishop. Very, I like that. That's, that's a piece of right there to use. In my mind, I'm like, okay, Matthew's 18. A lot of times, man, you just, listen, all forefathers, Christ was crucified and he didn't deserve it. Stephen was put to death. He said, forgive them. Certain thing, I wouldn't even Matthew's 18 you, but I just move on with life because I see the bigger picture. You know, my thing is that if I come to you about something and you don't see it, now I got to get a witness. And then, and then some of the stuff you be Matthew's 18, it be comical, it would be stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. It don't be no serious stuff. You said something that hurt my feelings. I wouldn't even waste my time talking to nobody. You said hurt my feelings. Oh, God. I'm going to have to get a witness. Well, I don't see it. Well, let me get two witnesses. Do you know he said that I have a big stomach? I need you to hear him say it. See, didn't you say that? Oh, gosh. Come on. Are you serious? What are you doing, God? You got a big stomach. What do you mean to say? <laughs> yeah, brother. Okay, thank you. Go to the gym with me. <laughs> do you want to <laughs> Matthew's 18 about everything. You big baby. But hey, but he said... Suffer wrong. What the deacon just said, take all the bullets out of the gun. All right, brother, I'm sorry. Think about it. It's just words. I'm sorry. It's not like he told you, you got to cut out your liver and give it to me. It's, it's some t I'm sorry. And mean it. I'm sorry. Just let it go. But that nigga pride on you, boy. Oof. That thing, will, that thing will leave you desolate. Very good precept. Where do we leave off at? Ten and what? 10 and verse 14. We have 14. Psalms? Am, am I? Oh, we back in Psalms. No, 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 no. Stop, stop. What's the last scripture we left that at? That was Proverbs 29. 
And then we... Uh, oh, yeah, let's forget that. Okay. Uh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, I know. Uh, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Watch this. Ecclesiastes. That was a good precept in um, Corinthians. That was a precept right there. Ecclesiastes chapter... Watch this. Four. So we know this is all for Father Solomon, right? Bear with me. I think I'm going to start someplace else first. Just give me one second. Let me look at it. Yeah, let's go. Ecclesiastes 4. 4.13. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 13. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. Listen to what Solomon said. He said, better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will be no more admonished. Why do you think Solomon said that? What do you think Solomon suffered from? Pride. Why? Solomon had all the wisdom in the earth. He knew everything. He said, better to be a poor and wise child than to be an old foolish king who nobody can tell him anything. Jump up in the chapter. I want you to read verse 9. Verse 9. Two are better than one. Because they have a good reward for their labor. So for somebody to admonish you, they got to be somebody along with you. So it says two is better than one. It's good to have somebody with you. It's better than being by yourself. It's better than pulling away from the body to help. It says two is better than one. Now Solomon, well, I ain't going to say it. Let's read on. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone. So the one that falls or sin, how's he going to lift him up? He's going to correct him. Read on. When he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. That's why I said you sell your soul. You sell your life away. For one morsel, you let everything go? Your lifeline? Read on. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So now you add men to your body, to the body. Three cord cord, a three cord, threefold. Sorry. Threefold cord is not equally broken. Why? It's strong. There's checks and balances there. But watch what he says next. Better is a poor and wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. Right. It says that foolish king will no more be admonished. You can't tell him anything. Now, Solomon's life. He couldn't be told anything, he said at one point. What happened? Watch this. Stay in the same, stay in the same book. Let's jump to... Chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 9. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. So, so Solomon now is coming back and telling you, through his life experiences, after he couldn't be told anything, man, brothers, live joyfully with the wife of thy youth. I learned the hard way. The woman I had, I, I, I was coming up with, I didn't live joyful with her. He said, this is your portion underneath the sun. Somebody was trying to tell Solomon, yo, you're making mistakes. But he's like, nah, can't tell me nothing. I got all wisdom. I know what I'm doing. 
You know when you figure that out? One day you wake up and everything is in ruin. Trust me, I'm speaking to you men that walked up out of here. You may not admit it, but I know that some days you wake up and you regret the mistakes you made, the decisions you made. Mm. And you out there alone. And your God, Satan, got you thinking you're right. But we know that you're alone and you miss. Bye-bye. <laughs> it's cold out there. Boy, I ain't never leaving a body. I, I mean, I ain't crazy. No more. <laughs> I ain't going... I, going nowhere. <laughs> Hell no. So anyway, back to the point. Solomon's having this moment where he's saying, damn, man, why was the Solomon joyful with the wife of his youth? Watch this. Just go back in Ecclesiastes. I want to read 2 and 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 1. I need you to power read right now for me. I said in my heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad and of mirth. What doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven, all the days of their life. So Solomon said he gave hold to know madness too. Remember, he had all wisdom. He said, I want to know what they are there doing is drinking. What do you think he was drinking? Gosh, I, I got to. You think he was just drinking with a bunch of dudes sitting on a dirty couch with a dirty garment on? You think that's what they was doing? Solomon had all riches. What do you think he was doing when he was drinking? Nobody knows. What would you be doing? Nobody knows. Oh, gosh. <laughs> what, give me an example. You got, okay, here we go. You got drink. And what is going to go along with the drink? Thank you. Don't say dudes, please. Lord Jesus. That's a, another problem. It's women. What, read on. I made me great works. I built me houses. I planted me vineyards. He said I had money. Read on. I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. Jeshua was fat, and they kick. He had it all. He was good. I have money. Nigga, what? What, man? I know all wisdom, man. Things are good. Read on. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. Read on. I got me servants and maidens, and servants board in my house. He said, I got servants. I'm, I'm, I have all that life can offer. Read on. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold and the peculiar tre treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. He was turned up. Read on. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. Listen to what he's saying. With all that he had, he said, I still have wisdom with me. But what did he say in Wisdom of Solomon? Wisdom cannot enter a malicious soul, nor dwell in a... Please get it. Well, I could butcher scripture, man. Wisdom of Solomon 1. <laughs> yes, sir. We're going to come right back here. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 1, verse 4. For into a malicious soul, wisdom shall not enter nor dwell in the body that is subject to sin. Wisdom cannot dwell in a body subject to sin, so that means you have wisdom. You let something else enter in, and wisdom will begin to fade away. We read that in 28 of Isaiah 1. That fruit or that tree began to fade away. His wisdom began to fade. Now let's go back to uh, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 10. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not mine heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. So 
There was no profit in all that he did. He realized. But it was at a cost. And we're going to read about that cost. It was at a cost. So in his mind, he's, you know, he was all right, I got money, whatever, and I'm doing this, and you can't tell me nothing. But when he came back later in his life, he realized, man, I should live joyfully with the wife of my youth. So when he was turned up with all these male singers and women singers in the houses, you know he wasn't with his wife. She was where she was at. He was waking up drunk from the night before, turned up. God knows what women was in the bed and he was dealing with whatever. Where was his son being guided by him? People was trying to tell him he's making mistakes, but because of pride, he thought he knew he wouldn't accept it. What's the next verse? Read. Verse 12. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath been already done? What is he trying to tell you? What can you do more than what I did? Because you don't have more money than me. I've done it all, and I've had all wisdom. But because of pride, with, even with the wisdom he had, because of pride, he would not listen. That's why he said, two is better than one, and a three-quarter is not easily broken. But he says, because of pride, an old fool's king would not be admonished. Now watch this. Let's go to uh, Kings. First Kings 12. First Kings 12. Let's start with verse 6. First Th- this, this is Solomon's son's Rehoboam, right? Read on. First Kings chapter 12, verse 6. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon and his father, his father, while he yet lived, and said, how do ye advise that I may answer this people? So I'm going to bring it to speed. Solomon passed, his son Rehoboam is in charge now. So he went to the the wise men that was Solomon's counselors and said, how do I advise this people? The people was northern kingdom at the time. They went away to build. They went to, uh, what, 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 huh? What land did they go to get the wood? From Herod. Huh? Lebanon, to get the cedars of Lebanon. They worked there for years, building the Most High's temple, then turning around and building all Solomon's houses. They worked. So now he's dead. Railboam is in charge now. Read on. And they spake to, unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him. So he forsook the counsel of the old men. Pride. Pride. He didn't want to listen. He said, these people serve you. But he then he what? And, oh, and, stop. Yes, sir. I'm thinking, join hand in hand. Where's that at again? Oh, Proverbs. Proverbs what? 16? Jo- just look, find that for me real quick. 1121. Man. 11 what? It should be 11 and 21. Okay, hold this. Yes, sir. Right. Well, quote it for me. Uh, Proverbs 11 and 21. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. 11, 11, 11, 11, 11, 21. Why do I want that? Verse 20. Verse 20, they that are of a... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sir. Is, don't they draw a hand in hand with the wicked? What verse did I start at before? That's not the one I want. I can't remember. Let's go back. That's not the one I want. There's another one. First Kings chapter 12. And verse 9, and he said unto them, what counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with them spake unto him, saying, thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, thy father made our yoke heavy 
but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt say unto them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. So listen to what he said. Rehoboam didn't li- he forsook the counsel of the elders, and because of pride, he went to these young men. And the counsel he got was to be disrespectful. He told them, let me tell you something. He said, you thought my father was bad. My, lingo, my little finger, I'm trying to find the right, right words. So I can say it. My little finger is going to be bigger than my father. In other words, I'm going to you. Wow. Now, why do you think he would talk like that? His father wasn't there to guide him like that. His father was partying. His father was full of pride. Solomon came around at the end and realized all it was foolishness. But he wasn't that, that spending that meaningful time with his son and guiding him. He wasn't there. That's why he came full circle and said, man, live joyful with the wife of your youth. This is your portion underneath the sun. He's leaving that as an example for us to learn from. He said, you can't do more than me because I've done, done it all. And I'm telling you, it ain't going to work. Don't let pride govern you. So he said, read on. And now whereas my father did laid you with a, a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father have chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Now watch this. That was, he said, I'm going to chastise thee with scorpions. He said, I'm going to give you a harder work. Now watch this. God gave Solomon all wisdom to understand everything. Watch this. Let's go back one chapter, chapter 11. Chapter 11, I want to start with verse 1. Proverbs, I'm sorry, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Did not God warn him about this? But his pride, read on. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. So God told him not to do it. And guess what? He was wise in his own conceits. He rejected God's counsel. Pride took him. That's why he said, I sought to know folly. I wanted to find out. Let's see what turned out from that. Read on. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, and was as was the heart of his father of David his father. Now it says, And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did his father David. Now, Check out this. He said, did David heart, was David heart always after God? No, it wasn't. David repented and was called a friend of God, but David heart wasn't always after God. Think about because of David's pride. What did he do? Committed adultery, put, took him, partake in murdering. Solomon's mother played the whore with David. This is what he grew up understanding. My mom had a husband for this and my dad killed him. Nobody wants David's life. David's son raped his sister. David's other son Slept with David's wife on the roof in front of everybody. David's other son tried to kill him. Pride. Pride caused that. David had a breakdown, and that's why he wrote Psalms 51. I'm wrong, Lord. I'm sorry. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Take away that obstinate heart from me. Solomon did it too. 
So Solomon came up in that life. When David should be instructing him, oh, wait a second. Before I say it, I don't want to say no more. I'm going to read. Uh, what verse do we leave off at? Verse 4. Read on. Verse 5. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David, his father. He didn't go fully after, like David, his father. Can I real quick, remind me that scripture where David said about being a young man. Find it for me. A young fool, yeah. No, I want where he spoke and God gave, he asked God for wisdom. There's a word in there, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, read on. First oh. Kings 11, verse 7. Then did Solomon build in high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Now listen, Solomon built the temple to the Most High God, and he turned around and built a temple to other gods. You understand, he put his money to building a temple. With all the wisdom he had, he turned around and built temples to other gods. Why? Pride. He would not be correct. You think nobody was around Solomon telling Solomon, man, what are you doing? You can't build. That's, that's another god, Solomon. You think this, everybody sat quiet? No, he had prophets that went on earth and tell him, yo, Solomon, you can't do that. Yo, what are you doing? And Solomon would not hear it. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, hold that. They but, would not, he would not listen. It could not be reproved. A temple don't get built, start today and tomorrow morning is built. You got to send for lumber. You got to bring the workmen. They got to nail and put golds and fasten. And you're watching the temple go up, and nobody can tell Solomon anything. He said, I was an old foolish king. We're going to come right back here. First Kings 3. three. three. Watch, this. Watch this real quick. 1 Kings 3, verse, 1 Kings 3 and what? It's 7. 3 and 7. What's this? Solomon, shoot. Start with verse, verse 6. Verse 6. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David my father great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth, and in, uh, and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as at this day. Now listen to what he says. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. He said, I'm, I'm nothing, I'm but a little child. Now go back to hold this. I want you to hold this, hold the other chapter, and then go back to... Ecclesiastes. I want you to remember he said, I'm but a little child. Ecclesiastes 4. He said, you gave the throne to, to you promised the oath to my father David and gave me the throne. Right? What's this? 4 verse 13. Ecclesiastes 4 verse 13. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king. He was talking about when he was young. He was poor in spirit. He was better as a poor and wise child. When I was young and I had the mind to just serve God, that I grew into this foolish king that could not be reproved. That's how many of us come as truth. We, we, we know we want to learn. We, we're, we're, we're pliable. We're being worked with. Then after a while we grow, we become hardened. We think we know. That's why it tells you, young men, don't be novices, lift up in pride. Sometimes you hear Bishop talking and people be thinking he's, damn, why is he so mean? Now, you better not process as mean at all. He's trying to save you. Pace yourself. This race is not for the swift. <laughs> you think he's going to do, it's all saying, you be one of those sparklers, you come out flaming, and you just fizzle out. Come out hot. This is not that kind of race. This is a long... 
pace yourself. Prepare yourself for what's going to happen. So read that one more time. 4 and 13. Better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king. He remembered that. He said, better is a poor when I was poor and a wise child. I was wise because I went to God and asked God, you know, thanking God for giving me this position. Let's go back to our three. I want you to read verse seven again. First Kings chapter three, verse seven. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. What was he saying? God, I need you to direct me. I need you to direct me. You think God directed him to build a, a temple to another God? No, pride did it. He said, I don't know nothing. Read on. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart, to judge thy people. He said, give thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people. So guess what? So Solomon had a spirit of pride on him, right? As the officers saw his judges, right? Who came next? Rehoboam. Pride. He taught him an evil lesson. Hold that right there. Go back to Kings um, 11. First Kings chapter 11 and verse 8. And likewise did he for all the strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. God appeared unto Solomon twice, and his heart turned from God. We just read one time he appeared unto him just now in chapter 3. And he was a young child. He said, thank you. Go to chapter 9, verse 2. We're going to come right back here. First Kings chapter 9 and verse 2. That the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared unto him in, at Gibeon. Read on. And the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hollowed this house which thou was built to put my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. Jump down to verse 5. Verse 5. Then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them. And this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out, my, cast out of my sight. And Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. He told him, listen, I appear unto you two times. And I'm telling you, if you sin against me, I'm going to cast you out. Go to Titus 3, verse 10. This is the book of Titus, chapter 3 and verse 10. All right. All right. 3 and 10. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. God reject him. Twice he came to him, gave him. God came to him twice and dealt with him directly. He said, I came to you for a second time. Now, time to reject you. His son, Rehoboam, came in place. His son had no skill on how to guide. Because of pride, he took the wrong counsel, and the kingdom was rent from that house. You all understand? Watch this. I want to go from there. Proverbs 16. It says 16, Bishop. Please. Okay. Proverbs chapter 16, verse and, 18. And verse 18. Pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before a fall. And a haughty spirit. Pride goeth before destruction. So you already know when you identify that you have a spirit of pride on you, and every man knows himself, know it's setting you up for destruction. The end result of that pride will be, I hope you understand that, the end of that pride will be destruction. 
And what? Verse 18. And a hearty spirit before a fall. Jump on down to verse 25. Verse 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And that's what pride does. It makes you seem that you right. It will convince you. That's why he says the heart is desperately wicked. But when you have brothers around you and sisters that's there, those are your checks and balances right there. Those are your checks and balances. You cannot tell me that you find yourself, and I always do this, this year like this. Happy Sabbath, happy feast. And the next year, I can't stand his guts. He was just cool the other day. The Bible's a playing field. What, what, what had happened? <laughs> how, did, how did it get from that? Somebody got pride. Somebody ain't right. How could me and Captain Isaac be at odds if we both believe the same book? How can it be? How can it be some kind of confusion? It's a simple solve. Hey, you did this. Oh, you did that. Okay, cool. Let's just stop that. Let's get this. Okay, fine. Only pride. Wherever there's confusion, there's every evil work. Somebody don't want to be right. I just took a picture with you six months ago. What did he do or I do that me and him are at odds? Humble. So verse 25 again. Verse 25. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But the end where are, are the ways of death. So the end result of it, you're going to sell your life because of pride. You're going to lose everything because of it. Pride. And then you wonder why you stumble at the word. You don't understand judgment. You're confused. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes, real quick. Ecclesiastes. Um, uh, what verse was that? Uh, we read uh, 9 and 9. Let's read. Let's read 9 and 9 again. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 9. Live joyfully with the wife who thou lovest all the days of the life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. That's why he said that. He came back and said, man, y'all live joyful with the wife of thy youth. That was the portion I was giving to you under the sun. Read on. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Right. Whatever you find your hand to do, do it with your might. That's like you putting your hand to this plow and looking back. You grabbed onto the, all of you, I hope you all know, you all grabbed onto this plow to build. This ain't no turning back. You understand, turning away from this means you damning yourself. And here some people will convince themselves, I'm not leaving the truth. Riddle me this. Help me understand. Name, by show of hand, who's been in this truth within this congregation more than five years out here? Five, five years, five years. Name one person that has been here. There's no problem. Just gets up and say, shalom, everybody. I want to thank you for all you've done, but I'm moving on. Nobody does that. When people leave, it's because something ain't right. And there you go. You leave because you think you're right. Well, if you're right, wouldn't you stay to help the body and help Bill and help fix the problem? Shepherds, uh, shepherds don't leave. Hirelings flee. Right. Maybe you are the solution. What makes you think you should leave? Because it seems right in your mind. 
Memo, don't listen to you. <laughs> don't listen to yourself. So you want to say? No, sir. Okay. Well, what's this? Um, uh, same chapter, verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to all. All of us have, to, it, it, this race is not for the swift. This ain't how much, I'm telling you right now, this truth ain't about how much you know. I'm telling you that from now. It's how much you apply. Y'all can mark your Bible yellow for this, pink for that, fine point pens, you go a little warm up by all the tools and your pocket protectors and everything here, and you got your Bible high up, look like this, and when problems happen, it's what you do. And you're in your feelings. Do you know what I'm highlighting you doing your Bible? What you're doing is you're preparing for the exam that you're about to take. And then when the exam comes, you close the book. It's an open book test. Just open it back up. And what it says to do, that's what you do. What it says not to do, here's the key. Don't do it. You close and go into your feelings. That's, that's nigger pride. It's nigger pride. I feel, I think, I was wronged, I was this. Christ was crucified, and he didn't deserve it. He took it. Please spare me what your problem is. I was going to say, big man, size 18 foot, and he said, my feelings are hurt. Nigger, please. You better pee sitting down. It says, uh, nor the battle for the strong, neither yet bread for the wise, nor riches for men of understanding, nor yet favor for men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. You know what it means when time and chance happen to them all? We all have that time, that lifeline. And I'm telling you, for some reason, today might be that for some of you. This is that lifeline right now coming out to you to help shake you up. This is your chance to say, you know what? God was talking to me. I know I've been in classes before, and I'm here classes going on, and I'm like, oh, gosh. You can't put the priest and the better together. Certainly you must be talking about me. How do you know? That's your lifeline. That's when you have that 1 Corinthians 13. Examine yourselves. Know you not your own selves? Don't you know? Don't you know what you're battling, what's inside of you? Examine yourself. These scriptures are that lifeline. Time and chance, everybody have an opportunity. Read that in verse 4. Verse 4. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. There is what? There is hope. We don't. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. It's saying while you're alive, there's hope to fix it. What would stop you from fixing it? Pride. Pride would make you stop you. And you know what pride, you know why pride would stop you from fixing it? Jump back one chapter, verse 11, 8 and 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. That's why. Because judgment is not executed speedily, pride set in. You think you can get away with it. I guarantee you, if judgment, if you do right now and judgment is right after, that pride stuff will go out the window so fast. Men are set to do evil, to justify themselves, will not turn away from their sins. Watch this. Sirach 23, verse 2. This is the book of Sirach, chapter 23, and verse 2. Who will set scourges over my thoughts and the discipline of wisdom over mine heart? Who? Read on. That they spare me not for mine ignorances, and it pass not by my sins. What? That's what we want. Oh, start with verse 1. I'm sorry. Uh, Sirach, chapter 23, verse 1. O Lord. Father and governor of all my whole life, leave me not to their counsels and let me not fall by them. To whose counsels? To your own counsels. 
Don't lead me to my own mind, Lord, please. And don't join me to a person with the same problem I have because together we both are going to convince ourselves that we right. People be leaving, they be leaving out here in twos and threes, and they all get together, and they're gone and they're bitter, and they watch the videos. <laughs> Negro, you smitten with madness. Psycho. You leave and you stand back and you sit and watch the videos and be like, oh, and then you get your Bible and try to find precepts to explain everything or re-explain everything. You shall know them by their fruits. It says what? Read that one more time, please. O Lord, Father and Governor of all, my whole life, leave me not to their counsels and let me not fall by them. Read on. Who will set scourges over my thoughts? Who will set scourges over my thoughts? Read on. And the discipline of wisdom over my heart, that they spare me not for my ignorances. That's what you want. You don't want to be spared for your ignorances. You need to be told. Hey, bro, what you doing, man? Yo, sis, what you doing? No, don't do that. You're destroying yourself. You understand that? We don't. That they spare me not for my ignorances, and it pass not by my sins. Read. Lest my ignorances increase, and my sins abound to my destruction. And I fall before my adversaries, and my enemies rejoice over me, whose hope is far from thy mercy. Look what he's praying for, man. Please, read on. O Lord, Father and God of my life, Give me not a proud look. Pride. Don't give, me a, don't give me a spirit of pride. Read on. But turn away from thy servants always a haughty mind. Please turn away that haughty mind from me, God. Give me a mind that I'm, listen to me, all of us in this truth, we better have a mind that is pliable. That means bending, willing to change, conform, adapt. God's laws are straight, strict, unmovable. We have to form ourselves into that, not that form around us. Oh, I'm doing that wrong? Okay, I'm over here. I'm done. Let me get this right right here. Okay, I humble down, down, down here. I got to stand up here. I'm just moving. I just want to make sure I can find how I can fit into the mold that's set. A nigga want to break the mold and remake the mold. That's not how it works. Set scourges over my mind. Give me a conscience, Lord. Don't let me listen to myself. Don't let me have a proud mind where I can't be. And you will tell them, and they still won't get it. They still won't get it. Because their God, Satan, got them, and they bound. Everybody understand it? Yes, sir. Oh, cool. All right, good. All praises. Let's read on. Turn away from me, vain hopes and concupiscence. You know, vain hopes lies. Lie, turn away from me, lies. Read on. And thou shalt hold him up that is desirous always to serve thee. And you're going to hold up them that is pliable, that's moldable, that's conformable, that's willing to change so we can measure up to the full stature of Christ. All of us got to be like that. Hey, yo, I'm sorry. Yo, I'm sorry. My bad. My bad. If we both move on like that, no, nah, no, nah, I'm sorry. Brother, I understand. I'm good now. We're good. Okay, thank you. Let's move. Can I tell you something sometimes about, about apologies? Apology is not really for the person who you're apologizing for. Because if I stole from Captain Isaac and I say I'm sorry, that don't really fix that I stole from him. He's still out of what he's out of. I give him back what he want. That apology is more so for you, that you're identifying you got a problem. That's why when you go to, the, to, to AA, you've been going there for 15 years, you get up and say, hi, my name is Chuck and I'm an alcoholic. You may not have had a drink in 10 years, but you're making sure you identify that you never go too far away that you could slip. You always keep in mind that I got to be conscious of my actions. So when you apologize, that's, a more, that's more so for you to verbally acknowledge or you sit there, know you're wrong, and you won't answer. When I say I have to be laughing, I'm like, why? He must not understand these scriptures. You sit there with that face like, I'm not saying yay or nay. I'm just going to sit there. 
You already said it to me. I, I, know what you, I know what you're saying. You're just not saying with words. This is what you're saying to me. Hold the mic. I ain't telling you nothing, nigga. <laughs> That's what I see. Oh, boy. Hey, Bishop. Can yeah, I, go ahead. Scripture? Yeah, please. Uh, I'm going to read uh, 2 Ezra chapter 8, verse 35, because what you said was heavy. As is very dangerous when you convince yourself that you don't deal with a certain spirit. Uh, we always got to make sure that we are aware of what we deal with, even if we've overcome in a few years or however long it's been. We always got to remember that we all deal with something. Um, this book is 2 Ezra chapter 8, verse 35. It says, For in truth there is no man among them that be born, but he hath dealt wickedly. And among the faithful there is none which hath not done amiss. So just like we're reading about the forefather, King Solomon, what did he do? Wisest man that ever lived on the face of the earth, but even he went off. So it's always important for us to remind ourselves that we all deal with something. Very good point. So don't think none of us was great as and, and Solomon, and he made mistakes. David, I mean, it's just you got to be able to humble. And sometimes, like with David, the Most High broke him down from to acknowledge it. Trust me, at the end of Solomon's life, Solomon said in Sirach, man, I should have already taught that. That book itself, you can say, not Sirach, Ecclesiastes, and explain. Solomon laid it on a line in Ecclesiastes. At the end of it, he said, man, let me tell you something. The whole duty of man is fear God and keep his commandments. Because he's going to bring everything into judgment. Those that are, I'm a, you know, I could butcher scripture. That are in secret. Get that real quick because I'm going to butcher it. I know what it means. I just can't say it. What would you say, Bishop? I'm sorry. Sirach, tw uh, Ecclesiastes 12. The whole conclusion. Yes, sir. This one word, the secret is the word I want. This is the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Why do, you think he's, I'm sorry, why do you think he's saying that for? He's coming full circle and tell you, man, this is how it goes down. I'm telling you, I've done it all. I've seen it all. I've been there. You can never do more than me. I had all wisdom, and I pissed it off with the stuff I did. And here's the whole duty of man. To do what? Fear God and keep his commandments. He said, man, listen to me. I'm telling you. Now, here's a wise man. Learn from somebody else's mistakes or learn from your own. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So whether every secret thing, if it's good or evil, Solomon is telling you it's going to come into judgment. So while he's writing stuff, he already told you, man, I didn't live joyfully with the wife of my youth, man. I made some, some mistakes on how I dealt. I'm telling you, you know what? I, I was an old foolish king that wouldn't be admonished. And now I got to live through the effects of my decisions. And I'm just letting you know, man, no real talk. Just keep the commandments. But that's the whole doing, man. And every work is going to be brought into judgment, either secret or not. That's for us to realize, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to let a spirit of pride get on me where I can't be told nothing. I'm not going to allow that to be me because Solomon told me it just doesn't work. All right. Where did we leave off at, uh, officer? We, uh, you was in Ecclesiastes before. Uh, let's drop that. I'm going to wrap it up in a second. A um, couple of things I want to read real quick. Um, First Timothy's four. First Timothy's four, one and two. This is the book of First Timothy, chapter four, verse one. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's some people because of their pride. Their conscience is seared. It's in the last day. Some people's conscience is going to be seared with a hot iron. It don't matter what you say to them, they will not see it. Who's ever had a white tea before and you burnt it? It don't matter how much you try to wash it out. That's why some people, they're just appointed to death. You just got to let them be. Bye. Your mind is gone. No fixing you. You're a broken toy. Bye-bye. 
got to go. Their mind are seared with a hot iron. Jeremiah 13. Don't let that be you. And Lord forbid it's me. 13.9. Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 9. Thus saith the Lord, after this manner will I mar the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. Damn. Read on. This evil people which refuse to hear my words. Pride. Which walk in the imagination of their heart. Pride. And walk after other gods. <laughs> to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. For he said, he say, you're no use to me because of your pride. Read on. For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused thee to cleave unto me, the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, saith the Lord, that they might be unto me for a people and for a name and for a praise and for a glory, but they would not hear. Damn. He said, I chose you to be a glory to me for a name and glory, yet they would not listen. They gave up to be called the sons of God and get all the blessings and glory that it's have to offer. Why didn't we accept that? Just like Solomon, we wanted to follow you. We wanted to go to folly. And God said, damn, you that prideful, I'm punishing you, and you still don't want me? You will not hear me, and I chose you, and I lent you your life? You that prideful, that you won't humble to me, then death. We don't. Verse, verse 11. Oh, I dropped that. That's good. Yes, I'm sir. about to wrap it up. Uh, give me uh, Jeremiah 17 and 1. Because we was reading that earlier in Jeremiah 17 and 4. Watch this. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 1. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart. And upon the horns of your altars, whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. So it says, the sins of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond. That's why when sin comes, we bang that thing down because it's so graven, and engraved, etched in our minds. We have to continue trying to beat that thought out of our people. Let go of that prideful spirit. Let go of that, that arrogant spirit where you cannot be told. We're going to wrap it up. Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8. One more second. Eight thirteen. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way. And the forward mouth do I hate. Right. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, to hate pride, to hate arrogancy, and an evil way. And the forward mouth do I hate. A mouth that speak unadvisedly against what the scripture says. Here's a level of pride. Somebody sinned against you, Jerem, uh, Luke 17 said you must forgive. Well, I don't know if I can do that. I, I mean, I was really hurt, and, you know, my, you know, I don't understand. The Bible says you must forgive. Well, uh, you, you don't understand what happened to me. doesn't matter. The Bible says you must forgive. Well, that's easy for you to say. The Bible says you must forgive. It says you must forgive. But, but okay, man, you're actually, bye. You, you, you're fading. You're fading away from this. This is not for you. This is not for you. Okay. James 1. We're going to wrap it up. I'm sorry. Give me one second. My Bible's went to bed. James 1. Give me. I'm sorry, James, not James 1. James 4, four 1. James chapter 4 and verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? Ye so, so, so sometimes 
you find he's warring fighting amongst you because you're warring something inside of you. Something is warring inside of you. So that's why sometimes we talk, we're like, what's going on with you, bro? What's going on, you sis? Why are you acting like that? There's something inside of you that is pushing you to behave a certain way. So when you see problems in the household with marriages and brothers, there's always a contention, something is wrong. Because why do I say that? Because in chapter 3, verse 17, it says what? But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. Right, because the wisdom up from above is first pure, it's gentle, it's easy to be entreated. The wisdom from God is easy to be entreated. Quick, fast, things will get solved. But once cometh wars and fighting, because there's something war inside of you where you cannot submit to what's being told. And that will be your destruction. So, Israel, I'm going to pause there. I pray that you receive something from today's class. Uh, stay tuned. Bishop will be on in a few. And Godspeed.